The Sahara is the largest desert on Earth. And without water, the last place you'd expect to find crocodiles. But now, two discoveries in this desert may change this view forever. In Egypt, a lost world of the pharaohs is being unearthed. It reveals how they once worshipped the crocodile as a god. And across the other side of the Sahara, a young researcher has made another extraordinary discovery. Oh. Uh, what's that? Pharaoh's crocodiles were thought to be lost forever. Has she found them alive in the heart of the desert? Thousands of years ago, the Sahara was green and fertile. The animals of the plains migrated far into North Africa. And in the rivers, the mighty Nile, one killer ruled. The Nile crocodile was a danger to both man and beast. Yet to Egypt's pharaohs, it was sacred the earthly form of Sobek, the crocodile-headed god. Known as god of the water, Sobek was thought to have powers that extended to the very creation of the world. But as the pharaoh's power faded around 2,000 years ago, the crocodile began to lose its sacred status. Hunted from the rivers and with the sands of the Sahara closing in, the pharaoh's crocodiles had nowhere left to go. It was the same across all of North Africa. In one of the most dramatic changes of climate in human history, the rain stopped falling and the Sahara was born. Crocodiles cannot hunt or breed without water. As the desert took over, the water god faced an impossible future. According to the books, the Nile giants vanished from North Africa forever. The lords of the water were engulfed by the sands of time. But is the story of the pharaoh's crocodiles really a closed book? Far to the west, across 4,000 kilometers of Sahara sand, one young researcher is not so sure. Nine-year-old Tara Shine has lived and worked on the edge of the desert in Mauritania for more than two years. She came here from Ireland as an ecologist, studying the rare occurrence of water in the desert. But now she's been drawn into a completely different mystery. When she arrived in Mauritania, Tara had never heard of the pharaoh's lost crocodiles. But since then, all around her, she's heard tales of giant reptiles. Earlier travelers dismissed such beasts as large monitor lizards, which are widespread here. But Tara wanted to know more. Much of the talk is centered on a tiny settlement on the southern fringe of the Sahara. Two years ago, a journey here was to change her life forever. 
So I asked her, did she know what crocodiles were? And she's like, yeah, she knows exactly what they are and that there are crocodiles here. That over here east is a place called Metraucha um, where there are some crocodiles. And I said, you know, you're sure it's not a, a monitor lizard or something? She says, no, they're different. Before I came here, I probably only saw crocodiles in a zoo, so I didn't have any particular affinity for crocodiles. It was just chance chance that I talked to people that they told me their stories and that eventually one day I thought right I have to go and, and see whether this is for real or not. This parched landscape along the desert fringe can go without rain for eight months of the year. It seems the most unlikely place to find an animal that spends most of its life in the water. But the nomads are convinced. Ace says no, it's um, it, they've got it. They're definitely not a monitor lizard because they've got a long mouth. They're always in the water, lots of teeth. Here, who a wagvat, wala wagvatin, wala kaisin ma, wala. Oh yeah, big ones. He says like this. So he's describing the water places again. No, 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 no. With the, where the water is deeper, way over my head. And he's been over there and he's seen lots and lots of crocodiles, he says, and that they sometimes take goats and that they can even take a cow if they want to. <laughs> Water above one's head is a clue that Tara can't ignore. Then she unearths her first real sign, tracks that seem too big to be a lizard. It definitely looks like a crocodile. Now here you can see a tail dragging along the sand with two feet, one here and one here. This one's a little bit smudged, but here you can clearly see four or five claws, a bit of a webbed foot there in the center and then the digging in of the claws as it moves off in that direction. Could Tara be right where the experts are wrong? It's true, the books have got it wrong. Crocodiles are alive and well in the deserts of Mauritania. Like ghosts come back to life. When I got down really low and just crawled up onto this dune here, I could really get a close look at them. And then just a bit weird because they just don't fit in the landscape. They didn't look like they should have been there. They looked like they were like left behind, like a sort of bit prehistoric or dinosaur looking, something like that. It's a gorgeous place. It's, it's just an oasis in the, in the desert. It's lovely. But where do these animals come from? Are they descendants of the giant killers of the Nile? Will the trail of their ancestry lead all the way back to the pharaohs when the crocodile was worshipped as a god? Excavations in Egypt are shedding a whole new light on that time 3,000 years ago, when Sobek ruled. Nowhere was he more revered than here in Crocodilopolis, the ancient city of crocodiles, 100 kilometers from modern Cairo. 
Edda Brasciani, an Italian archaeologist, has spent 25 years studying Egypt's buried history. Her most recent discoveries are set to send a shockwave through the world of antiquities. Other temples have provided tantalizing glimpses of what happened to the pharaoh's crocodiles. But Edda's searching for the holy grail of archaeologists, a key piece of evidence that can reveal the full story. Salima Ikram from Cairo's American Institute is a lifelong devotee of the cult of the crocodile. She's come to Crocodilopolis to see Edda's finds for herself. 307. The original door. <laughs> well, yeah. Work. Okay. This. Around 300 AD, following an earthquake, these temples were sealed up for some reason and left untouched to be swallowed by the desert sands. And after there is all this part, all this is dedicated, of course, to the crocodile. Edda's gradually exposing a snapshot in time here, revealing the relationship between the Egyptian priests and their sacred giants. There, the crocodile was only one. Uh -huh. But here we found part of a dead crocodile from here and from here, so we are sure. It seems that in the temples up and down the Nile, thousands of crocodiles were sacrificed to Sobek in the belief that he could control the floodwaters and keep the land fertile. In the catacombs of temples like Komombo, the pharaoh's crocodiles can still be found, perfectly preserved in mummified form. A mummy like this may provide DNA that could be used to compare ancestry with the living crocodiles found by Tara. For Salima, this specimen is a window on the ancient ritual of sacrifice. Scales are very well preserved. Still got some bandages up here and then down on its back. The teeth are fantastic, really fantastic. We must have stuffed the mouth with something. Um, looks actually like mud. It's amazing to imagine that over 2,000 years ago, in this very spot, this crocodile would have been laid out on a table just like this one. And they would have burnt incense to protect him and guard against any evil spirit that would enter the body. And then they would start to bandage him slowly, using resin, and what you can still see here, they probably paint all over with resin. And then they would have dipped the bandages into the oils and the resins and wrapped them around the crocodile with the arms probably done separately saturated with resins and then they would tuck in amulets to keep the crocodile protected so he would make it to the afterlife safely. Although artifacts like these have given us insights into the cult of the crocodile, they can only really show us what happened to these animals in death. We knew very little about their lives until now. Edda's dig at Crocodilopolis is starting to provide some answers. A whole network of rooms is now emerging from the sand, showing the bond between the priests and crocodiles was more complex than anyone imagined. So can the secret surfacing in Egypt help Tara understand how crocodiles survive in Mauritania today? This one is a lifeline for the nomads of the area. So why they would share it with a crocodile that can potentially take their livestock is, is incredible. As Tara finds out more, it seems the traces of the old Egyptian reverence still exist. Crocodiles here have a huge advantage in that the local people 
um, protect them. They have no interest in, in eating them or of killing them for their skins. They also attach a sort of a mythical or semi-sacred value to them in which people believe that if their crocodiles go, then the water will also go because they are linked and associated with the presence of water. It would make sense that the answer to the crocodile's survival has to do with a sacred belief in their connection with water. Deeper into the Sahel, to the east, there is a small village in Mali, inhabited by a people called the Dogon. This isolated location can reveal exactly how crocodiles can survive against all the odds, thanks to a reverence from their human neighbors. Here, the bond between man and reptile is like nowhere else on Earth. The Egyptians thought Sobek had the power to control the Nile by withholding or releasing his sweat. Today, the Dogon also believe their precious water is dependent on the crocodiles. But there are difficulties in sharing your home with giant predators. To ward off this disaster, the villagers have appointed a crocodile keeper. He's not a holy man, he's the local butcher. But in these parts, his ability to communicate with crocodiles is legendary. The Dogon's crocodiles aren't seen as gods, but they are thought to possess mystical powers. And there are dire warnings for anyone who doesn't treat them with respect. The Dogon and their crocodiles have lived side by side for as long as people can remember. Here, the crocodile cult lives on. This remote place is a window on the time when Sobek ruled. While others of their kind have died out, this small group survives, but only by the grace of their human guardians. So, Artara's crocodiles in Mauritania are simply another relic of the past like those in Mali. 
A few survivors hanging on because humans look after them. Or could they make it on their own and be truly wild? In this part of Africa, for a short time in August, the heavens open. It's this deluge that will show Tara the true extent of her discovery. Almost overnight, the rain returns the desert to its ancient green. This momentary bloom of life is Tara's subject, what she came here to study. From the air, this looked like green, greenness in between the dunes, but down here, it's really lush. It's really just a little paradise, an oasis in the, in the desert, if you like. Once again, she's stumbling across crocodiles. Oh, they're here as well. A huge one, completely spaced out over there on that big log. This time, it isn't just a few survivors in an isolated pool. Suddenly, they're everywhere. Another one way back there, same kind of thing. He's just sitting on a, on a fallen log. He just hauled himself out, up the branch a little bit. Looks totally relaxed. I wonder if there's any more. There are well over 50 crocodiles in this temporary lake. It's a discovery that goes against all previous scientific presumption. It's time to find out some of the biology of these animals. But to do that, Tara's going to need some expert help. Hemo Nickel is a friend and reptile expert. If anyone can help her solve the riddle of the lost crocodiles, he can. South of here. And then I've seen them over here where we are now, mm -hmm. um, both in like a sort of a lowland wetland that, that dries up, so a temporary water area. But even Hemo is skeptical about the arrival of crocodiles in the desert. You're sure that's crocodiles? I mean, no, monitor lizards or whatever. <laughs> but they are. Then I know what a monitor. Everybody says, you know, it's a monitor lizard. I've seen a monitor lizard. It's not a monitor lizard. They are crocodiles. They have long heads, teeth. Look, it is, honestly. Well, you don't believe me. Tara. You got a rock python? No. Yeah, yeah. Where? Oh, it's big! Oh, it's lovely. No, I called Hemo because I'm not a herpetologist. I was studying wetlands and wetland ecology, but, you know, zoology isn't a speciality that I have. So I called him to try and understand more about, one, how important uh, a find were these crocodiles. What did it mean? Just changed the... The skin, so. Pull the back off. Always, always the person who holds the bag gets bitten. <laughs> <laughs> what about the bitey bit? <laughs> Tara can only hope that he's better at catching crocodiles than he is at snakes. And to catch a crocodile, you need to get out on the water. Do you have a boat? I have a very small blow-up children's boat that I brought over and that I collect water samples from. But, I mean, it's tiny. There we go. I'm going to push out a bit further. This may seem like a bad idea. A rubber dinghy on a crocodile-infested lagoon in the middle of the night. But it's the only way to find out more about these animals and whether they have Nile blood in their veins. Maybe something over there behind that tree. Oh, can we turn around, Hammer? 
I think that's something over there. Just look over there. Hey! Hello. Oh, she's tiny, eh? Hello. They've caught a youngster, no more than a year old. Oh, it's great. It may be small, but it's got backup. Worryingly, its cries are attracting rather too much interest from the adults. Oh. There are crocodiles all around. Look. They're all coming this way. They're responding to the juvenile's courts. Tara and Hemo are now the centre of attention. And the situation is getting more dangerous, but it's a perfect chance to land a larger specimen. Just over a meter long, but then so's the boat. Right, let's go. Tara can finally get her hands on her elusive crocodiles. It's the first time for her, but it's also the first time that these crocs have ever been examined close up. You're all right, hang on. Start there or there? Yeah. This one. One, two, three, four, five. Counting the belly scales may give a clue to its ancestry. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Does that one count? No. Fourteen. But what they really need is a DNA sample. It's like armored plating there on the top. Yeah, the skin's really soft all around the legs and the belly. Taking a what clipping from the tail scoot is there. as simple and as painless as cutting a human toenail. Two, three, and it may provide the answers Tara's looking for. Exactly where these animals came from and how closely related they are to the ancients of the Nile. Lid. To find out, they'll have to wait for the lab. But even if they discover the crocodile's origins, the burning question still remains. How on earth do they survive at all? in a place that may not see a drop of water for well over half the year. For now, it's hard to imagine this is the desert. It's September, the rains have worked their magic, and the wetland is providing bounty for all kinds of animals. A young crocodile must watch out that he does not become lunch. But this is a time to hone the deadly skills for which their kind is so renowned. Young crocodiles only have a few months to eat while there's water in the wetland. So they have to perfect the art of hunting quite quickly. But unfortunately, they have no one to teach them how, so they're awful at it at the beginning. So this guy is living here happily at the moment with, it seems like, quite a lot of other crocodiles. But the question is, what do they do when the water disappears? How do they survive? What do they eat? How do they survive the heat? I really have no idea what happens to them when this lake dries up. Right now, this is crocodile heaven. But soon, all this water will be gone. Only then will Tara be able to explore the final secrets of her crocodile's unlikely story. Under her feet is laid the start of that story, and the biggest miracle of their survival. While Tara waits, 
Across the other side of the Sahara in Egypt, Edda is realizing the pharaoh's priests knew more about their crocodile's biology than anyone had dreamed. Edda and her team have uncovered a secret chamber, and with it, a whole new dimension to this ancient world. In this room is evidence that's never seen the light of day before. A series of small water tanks, a specially designed crocodile nursery. This is where the pharaoh's crocodiles were raised during their early years, in a room carefully created to provide ideal temperature and humidity. And in a corner of this chamber, Edda unearths the biggest surprise of all. A clutch of 30 unhatched eggs, undisturbed for more than 2,000 years. It's the first evidence of where the pharaoh's crocodiles came from. The priests didn't just hunt wild crocodiles for sacrifice. They knew enough to rear them from the egg. For the first time, we get the full picture of the crocodile cult. Some crocodiles were decorated with gold bangles and allowed to roam around the temple grounds. And the real giants, those believed to embody Sobek himself, were treated more like the pampered pets of Mali than feared predators. Sobek was reared directly from the egg. Priest and crocodile god were bound together from cradle to grave, from egg to altar. This is Edda's big discovery. Of course, I was so excited, so full of uh, surprise, like a mi miracle because we can find eggs of the god Sob. It was something dream about this, but it was true. This strange twist in the tale shows that the pharaoh's crocodiles depended on their temple guardians. The whole life cycle was connected to the priest's crocodile cult. Without their divine status and protection, Maybe the crocodile's decline was inevitable. Their hatchlings destined to turn to dust. So are these long dead gods related to the living crocodiles Tara has found in Mauritania? The DNA Tara and Hemo collected has now been matched against the ancient samples extracted in Egypt. The results show Tara's living crocodiles do share the same original Nile bloodline as the pharaoh's sacred beasts. But there are crucial differences in some of the sequences of their DNA. Over thousands of years, these crocodiles and others in Western Africa, like those in Mali, have been isolated for so long, they've become a species in their own right. Here, the march of the desert has forced the water god to change. This is one of the hottest places anywhere on Earth. If Tara's crocodiles survive here all year round, they must face temperatures of more than 50 degrees in the shade. If Tara is to discover how these animals can adapt to such conditions, first she'll have to find them. This was all water a few months ago, and there's nothing left now. I can see the water level marked in the trees, so where I am now, the water would have been up to about here. Uh, I would have been walking through water lilies and water lettuce, and uh, it's all gone. There were over 50 crocodiles, and uh, I don't know where they're gone now. 
انا نبكري نا... نعرف لا عربيه كاملين انا ما نعرف تكتبي ما تعرف تكتبي ما نعرف نور نادلو نور نادلو نور نادل المدرسه عند المدرسه كنا صدرا كبيره يدير تحت قاع ويدخل في الصدر الكبير هو في صدر هو يدخل تحت الصدر انا الغران تحت الصدر ويدخل He says that the crocodiles are in trees, that they've gone into holes in the trees. That the water, because the water is gone, they find a tree with a big hole in it, and that's where they've gone. But, uh... There's no way that the crocodiles are in the trees. But they could be in a hole like this one. This is a big hole. This seems the most likely place to look. But if there are crocodiles in there, is it a good idea to stick your head down to see? I think they're moving around, but I can't see. It goes way back and dips down. <laughs> I'm <blown. laughs> Okay, hang on. <laughs> It's tough work pushing back the boundaries of science. <laughs> but this time Tara's got back up. The cavalry is on its way. Tara has seen wildlife films. She's watched boulder cam and dung cam in action. And a toy shop back home has provided her with a gadget of her own. The instructions on the box specifically say, do not operate in sand. But she's not about to give up now. Bismillah. Oh! Eh, But there's a good part. I don't know. I think he thinks I'm going to shoot it with this. No, no, it's sure. Harry, I'm going <laughs> yeah, they think that if I put it down there, um, that there's a good chance that the crocodile will just grab it and then I won't see it again. And it's very low and it's angled it's angling down just a really gentle sort of a decline down there's all roots little tiny roots hanging down from the ceiling crocodiles have been recorded hiding in burrows before the books say they dig down a few meters at most but tank cams at 15 meters and still going down Deep. I mean, I don't know how they dig them this deep. Oh, and now there's a fork. So like, there's one, one passage going off to the left and one going to the right. I'm going to go up to the left, to the left. <gasps> it's a crocodile! Oh, my God, look at that. He is massive. Hold on. Get Go around and get a look at his face. Look at those teeth. Whoa, he's huge. Wait, bush pine? He's yeah, not moving, he's just dying still. Look at the size of that front leg. I mean, I don't know, is it asleep? Is it. You'd think it would move. Look at here. Look at He's not moving. I'm like, I'm in his teeth practically, and he's not moving. A sleeping croc seems to make sense. It may be they're shutting down their bodies to sit out the heat. This kind of stupor has been seen in other animals. It's an extreme survival tactic known as Eastervating. And there seem to be sleepers down every fork in the tunnel. Oh my God, two, two, two. Two heads looking at me. They're not reacting either. Like, I mean, do they know I'm here? Hello? I think that means that they're 
in some kind of slumber or whether they just really don't know what on earth the tank is. But the extent to which these crocodiles are east of eating will need to be debated by the experts. Because not all the animals here are so shut down. You can see us. Look at his eye. Oh my! Look at those teeth. What's that? Oh, look a baby one beside him. Well, not a baby one, but a smaller one, like a juvenile. To observe a group of Nile crocodiles of different ages, all living together, 20 meters underground, and in a dried-up desert, this is something no one's ever seen before. And Tara is about to witness another biological first. Yet again, crocodiles are appearing where they're not supposed to be. Baby crocodiles normally head straight from the egg to water, often with the help of their mother. But their mother's nowhere to be seen, and there's no water for hundreds of miles. So how do they know what to do, which way to go? One by one, the tiny hatchlings make their way across the dried mud and down into the safety of a burrow. They've evolved a whole new strategy for survival. To discover how the crocodiles survive the dry periods that they dug long deep burrows i mean to to put the tank down the burrow and and send it you know over, over 15 meters down a hole to find a crocodile at the end of it i mean that's amazing and then finding eggs hatching tiny little perfectly formed baby crocodiles and knowing that you know the population is reproducing and is is going to be here hopefully for a good while longer that that's really nice Soon, the water will be back again. Just as Sobek was believed to have the power to foretell the flooding of the Nile, these hatchlings time their start in life to hit the coming of the rains. For Tara, this is the last crucial piece in the puzzle. She's not only discovered that Sobek is alive in the deserts of Mauritania, but she's started to unravel her extraordinary ability to beat the onslaught of the desert sands. Sobek has turned out to have more staying power than anyone gave him credit for. It seems the Egyptians chose their crocodile god well. They admired not just the power of the giants, but the resilience of the young. The pharaoh's crocodiles have been discovered, and they're not only lords of the water, but of the sands. And a respect for the crocodile is not just the preserve of the pharaohs. Here, in the most improbable of places, an unlikely ally has discovered her own bond with an animal she never expected to come into her life. I'm from Ireland. Where do crocodiles come into your life in Ireland? No. Now I'm terribly interested in crocodiles, but that's just because of uh, the way that life turned out. I'm already finding other crocodile populations. I've seen them in rocky areas and in caves. It's just the start of unraveling the mystery of how these incredible animals survive.